Hi there! I'm here today with Gus Gus because we were actually recently approached by the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center to talk about the bodacious animals of Southwest Florida and we thought, why not share it with you as well? So let's check out some of these rad creatures. This awesome creature is a diamondback terrapin. And this is a tortoise. And I wanna to talk to you about some of the turtles and tortoises that you're gonna run into in the wild here in Florida. So first of all, you're gonna see a lot of all of these shelled reptiles, right? And they're all turtles. But some of them are a specific group of turtles called the tortoises. And, and being able to distinguish between a turtle and a tortoise is kind of important, especially because a lot of turtles are very at home in the water and tortoises, not so much. And sometimes people don't know the difference and they end up taking a tortoise, which isn't a very strong swimmer and putting it in a canal or something, which that can be devastating. And the tortoises we have down in Florida are really, really important. They're called gopher tortoises and they're actually not very common anymore. They need our protection and they're really, really disproportionately important in the environment, especially because of the burrows that they make that are used by all sorts of other species. They're what you would call a keystone species, which just means that they're more important to the ecosystem than their numbers would imply. And to help you identify a gopher tortoise when you see one, I wanna to talk to you about the difference between tortoises and all the other turtles that you're gonna see. And the biggest thing, the biggest difference of all is gonna be their feet. You'll notice that this turtle, when it walks, puts its entire foot on the ground. It's called plantigrade. Whereas the tortoises walk up on their toes. They're what's called digitigrade, and they walk sort of like this, up on their toes, instead of with their legs flat, their feet flat, like the other turtles do. They've also got a, a more domed shell than most of the turtles, though you will see box turtles, which walk with their feet flat on the ground, but they've got a shell more like a tortoise. And the reality is, don't put box turtles or tortoises into canals. You honestly don't need to put any turtles into canals. If you find a turtle up on the road, be it a tortoise or a turtle, if you think it's a turtle, if you think it's an aquatic turtle especially, which tend to have these flatter sort of shells, not, not so highly domed, and webbed feet, like you can see on this terrapin. If you find if you find an aquatic turtle like this, then you might want to put it near a body of water, but not in a body of water. They're very, very good at moving on land as well. So if it's near a body of water, it'll get there. And if it's not a turtle that is used to swimming, it probably won't go in there. That'll be the best situation of all. And that will help protect our native gopher tortoises. Now, I want to talk to you about not only one of the coolest animals in Florida, but arguably one of the coolest animals in the entire world. One of the coolest animals to ever exist. And that is the American alligator. The American alligator is one of two native crocodilian species that you guys have down in Florida. The other being the American crocodile, which is really, really cool, but considerably more rare. Most of the time, if you see a big old crocodilian, it's an alligator, and alligators are awesome. They are a really important part of the ecosystem down in Florida. But you also need to be careful about the way that you interact with them because they're very powerful and they are potentially dangerous. One thing that I want to encourage you not to do is feed them. And it's very tempting to feed them because it's really, really cool. You get to see the way that they eat and you get to see them move and do things. But just think about this for a second. Not only are you potentially making these alligators dependent on humans for their survival, but on top of that, you're teaching them to associate humans with food. And you're encouraging alligators to approach humans when they want food, which in some cases is going to cause them to become what you call a nuisance alligator and could lead to them having to be killed. So you're putting the alligator's life in danger. You're also putting people's lives in danger by feeding them. And the best thing to do is to appreciate them from a safe distance, but don't feed them. They do have some really amazing jaws and their bite strength is absolutely incredible. They can bite down really hard. And what alligators do is they bite down and they hold on. If they do need to bite chunks off, they don't do it through chomping and chewing. They do it through spinning. They'll do what's called a death roll and they'll tear off pieces of stuff. But usually they will bite and they will pull things underwater and they will drown them. 
and you don't want that to be you. Should you ever find yourself in the mouth of an alligator, something you'll notice about alligators is that in the back of their throat, they have something called a palatal valve. What that valve does is it creates a, a dam, essentially, between their mouth and their stomach so that when they're underwater with their mouth open, their stomachs don't fill up. If you're ever attacked by an alligator, you need to keep your wits about you and you need to stick your hand into the back of their mouth and push down that valve. Then their stomachs will flood with water and they will let you go because they have a much bigger problem to deal with. Alligators make spectacular parents, by the way, which is a really neat thing, but something to be aware of. Even if you see little alligators like this guy, which aren't a danger to you, you should leave them alone. You can enjoy them, but enjoy them from a safe distance because oftentimes mom is still around and she is protecting them. And if they feel threatened, they start to call. You'll hear them. Arr, arr, arr. And to mommy, that means I need you to come kill somebody and she'll be on her way. Alligators, though, they are a really important part of the ecosystem. They very rarely put people in danger, but the main thing is just be smart. Be careful around water, especially if you know there are alligators there. Don't feed them, and you can have a wonderful relationship with your native alligators. This absolute legend of a snake is a young eastern indigo snake. And if you ever see one of these in the wild, consider yourself very, very fortunate because this is one of the most special snakes we have anywhere in the United States really anywhere in the world. Like I said, this one is a juvenile, but this is what they can grow to be as adults. This is a giant snake. Though most of the time when you see them, they'll probably be a little bit smaller like this one. They do get huge and that's awesome. The Eastern Indigo is the longest North American snake and it is a predator of other snakes primarily and they hunt in a really, really bodacious way. They've got very strong jaws and they just overpower other snakes. They'll grab them, they'll roll with them. These are basically the king cobras of the Americas. The notable difference is that these are not venomous, though they do feed upon a number of venomous snakes. And in the wild, these guys are actually endangered and they're definitely a snake that if you see one, you need to look at it, you need to enjoy it, take some pictures, but let it go on its way. You're gonna be able to identify them, especially as they get a little older. They are a jet black snake. They've often got a lot of red on their face, on their, on their chin, and a little bit going down onto their belly, but for the most part, they are jet black. There are a few other snakes with which you might confuse them. Uh, one of them being the water moccasin, uh, down in the Florida area, those are also pretty dark. I've had the pleasure of seeing some in Florida. That is a much heavier bodied snake with a much bigger, broader head, but it's also a snake that if you run into it, it's best just to leave it alone. You also might see black rat snakes, uh, black racers. There are a number of other dark colored snakes, uh, some of the water snakes that you're gonna see down there. They'll also be black. All of these snakes are awesome. All of them are super beneficial. They're lovely snakes. And if you decide to leave them all alone, they won't mind that a bit. Just enjoy these snakes. It's just incredible that you even have them. Now I wanna to talk to you about something that's actually really important for those of you, especially down in Florida, because Florida is a great place to live. Actually, not just for people and the native species that are there, but actually for a whole lot of animals that are found all over the world. Almost anything could survive in Florida. It's just such a rich ecosystem. Unfortunately, when you bring new animals and plants and all sorts of other organisms into a new environment where they don't exist naturally, they can often displace or like kick out the, the native species, the species that have been there for thousands and millions of years, and sometimes they can cause those other species to go extinct. One of the animals you're probably hearing about a lot are actually these Argentine black and white tegus. These guys come from South America, and they're actually a really important part of the environment in South America. However, historically, they didn't exist in Florida. 
Other species you might have heard about that have become introduced into Florida that don't occur there naturally are things like Nile monitors, iguanas, Burmese pythons, even things like dogs and cats. And tegus, like Gus Gus here, they don't belong down there either. In many cases, these animals will eat other animals that live down there. They will compete with native animals for food. Roll over, buddy. Good boy. Good boy. And while I think Gus Gus makes an absolutely spectacular pet, he's something that definitely shouldn't be released into the environment in Florida. And that's the mistake that people make sometimes, is that they will have a pet that they think is a great pet, but after a while they decide, you know what, this is too much for me, and they just let it go. And like I said, things like Nile monitors, tegus, Burmese pythons, iguanas, these animals have established really big populations down in Florida, and part of this may come from people who are irresponsible with their pets. Other animals that I definitely wanna talk about because it's important also are dogs and cats. Letting your dogs and cats roam around or releasing them into the wild, that can cause massive problems as well. And so it's not just the reptiles that can be devastating invasive species. In fact, in New Zealand, it is rumored that an entire species of bird was driven to extinction by one lighthouse keeper's cat. There is the possibility that multiple cats were involved, but cats have caused the extinctions of countless species all over the world. So keep your cats inside. This is a red rat snake, also known as a corn snake, which is a really, really popular pet snake because they're actually super pleasant and wonderful little guys. And you down in Florida are lucky enough to have these as well as a number of other rat snakes like yellow rat snakes and Everglades rat snakes. And all of these rat snakes are very valuable in the environment of Southern Florida. One of the things that these snakes do for us is they provide a lot of rodent control. These guys are big time rodent eaters. These are often associated with being in cornfields and they're not in cornfields because they like to eat corn. They're in cornfields because they like to eat the rodents that like to eat corn. These guys also have an amazing climbing ability. A lot of snakes can climb trees surprisingly well and rat snakes often can get up really high, sometimes to hunt birds, uh, sometimes just to escape from predators. When threatened, they can defend themselves. Their bite is nothing to worry about. Sometimes these are misidentified as being venomous snakes. They're not. We'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. But they can bite, but the bite, I mean, it's probably not even going to draw any blood. They'll rattle their tail sometimes, which makes an alarming noise, and they puff up and try to look big because when you're a little rat snake, the world's a pretty scary place, and the only chance you have of surviving if a predator like a big scary person finds you is to scare it away. Their last resort, if you pick one up, you might discover this, is they can musk you, which just means they kind of cover you with some stinky slime that they secrete from their vent down right by the base of their tail. And, and so they could leave you a little bit stinky, and that's about the most damage they can do. These are very, very sweet snakes. But like I said, sometimes they're misidentified as venomous snakes. Sometimes people even kill them because they think they're venomous, which Trying to kill a venomous snake is not a good idea. That's actually one of the best ways to get yourself bitten by a venomous snake. If you just leave it alone, you'll probably be fine. Very, very few people are bitten by venomous snakes and far fewer are killed by venomous snakes in the United States. In fact, you're more likely to be killed by a deer, and I'm talking about like from a deer attack than by a venomous snake in the United States. So venomous snakes are not a major threat to you. People will confuse these at times with copperheads, which are a much thicker, more heavy-bodied snake with a much larger triangular-shaped head. They could also potentially be mistaken for things like cottonmouths or rattlesnakes because of that rattling behavior. But again, those are all vipers, and they're heavy-bodied, thick snakes generally with big triangular-shaped heads. They actually look very different from this corn snake. The main thing to remember is if you don't know what kind of a snake it is, don't pick it up, right? Leave it alone and it will almost certainly leave you alone. This is a highly venomous coral snake, or is it? There is a very decent chance that you at some point will run across 
a tricolored snake like this. It has red and black and yellow. And you might wonder, is this a dangerous snake or is it not? And I will tell you that some snakes that look like this are very dangerous. The coral snakes, they're not very aggressive. If you leave them alone, they will leave you alone, but they have a very, very powerful venom. And so you don't want to pick one up on accident. We already said, if you don't know what it is, just leave it alone. And that's a wise thing to do with any of these snakes. However, if you want to be able to identify a coral snake from some of the other tricolored snakes that you might see, like milk snakes or scarlet snakes or scarlet king snakes, then the key will be to look at the order of the bands. This works really well in the United States. If you see that they've got bands where red touches yellow, well, that's a venomous coral snake. If you see that the bands are red touches black, like with this snake, then it is a harmless snake of some sort. Could be a king snake, could be a milk snake, and you can handle it safely. The only risk might be a totally harmless bite. Again, if you're not absolutely sure what kind of snake you're looking at, just leave it alone, right? But if you do, take the time to identify, okay, it's got red touching black, then you're safe. And you could pick it up if you wanted to. However, if you're outside of the United States, there are coral snakes with this exact patterning. Don't pick up any snake that looks like this. Coral snakes, by the way, are super important in the environment. They're really, really beautiful. They're really actually fairly rare. They're reclusive. They tend to stay to themselves and they don't bother anybody, but they actually provide a very important role in the environment. So just let them be. Thank you guys so much for coming with us on our tour of amazing Florida wildlife. Hopefully you continue to research on the native species in our area, as well as the introduced species and figure out ways that you can help to strengthen our, our natural habitats and natural places. I'd like to give a special thanks to the Charlotte Harbor Environmental Center for making this video possible. That's a really cool mission that you guys have. Keep going. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. I just realized I've, I've now been handling a snake, and now it's like, and now get the snake eater out. <laughs> Can you wash behind your ears? Oh, you're a good guy, aren't you? No, you're just a good turtle. Look at how beautiful this creature is. Can you uh, demonstrate one more time? Yes. <laughs> now that was, uh, that was a turtle? Or that, was a, that was a tortoise. That okay. was a tortoise. This would be a turtle. <laughs> totally different. And if they need to bite off chunk, and if they need to bite chunks off, they don't do it like, if they need to bite chunks off, they don't do it like through chomping and chewing. They do it through spinning. But like, if they need to bite off like chunks, <laughs> they like do it through like chomping and chewing. No, they do it through like spinning. They will do what's called a death roll and they will tear off pieces of stuff. <laughs> and if they feel threatened, they start to call. You'll hear them call, call, call. <laughs> As always, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession and rattle on.